Welcome back to the third part of our Women in Art series. I'm Timothy Maurice and this is Inside of Her C-Suite. We caught up with Lady Scola in the middle of Johannesburg CBD to have a conversation about sort of the business of arts. Lady Scully. Hey, nice thanks. to meet you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Inside of Our C-Suite. Cool. So this art, this art world, being in this art world, getting to a point yeah. of a fine artist and being well trained, when you were a kid, did you imagine yourself being in this moment? Yes. Did you? <laughs> yes. At what point when you were a child? Um, I think I've always wanted to be in art. I've never wanted to do anything else. I always tell people that because I remember always coming around the mountain and then you see, you see T on your left and so you're very much like, that's where I want to be. Um, I did go to art school, but only for three years. Okay. And then I figured out I didn't actually need art school I to see. be an artist. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think um, to me, I feel like I've been prepping for this moment like for a long time. I want to say since birth, but that would just sound too No, hectic. I get it, I get it, I get it. Uh, as a kid, did you have artists that were role models that really that, that drove you, look, you looked up to? Um, definitely, I am a huge Dali fan. I'm a huge Frida Kahlo fan. And those are all cliches, but I think mostly it's good because they allowed me as a child to imagine tapping into pain, tapping into um, imagination, tapping into all kinds of things that aren't there, but that art becomes like your companion. So yeah, and also Jared Sakoto and George Pemba. I really, I really enjoyed them. In terms of forming who you are, what role does pain? What role does growing up in Cape Town, you know, what role does these backdrops um, play in who you become? I think um, being a coloured like in the South African sense. And coming from Cape Town plays a massive role just because you see a lot of things like racial segregation. Um, Cape, Town, Cape Town for me is infamous for that because it feels like such a liberal place. But then once you figure out, oh, the coloreds are there, the whites are there, the blacks are there, um, it becomes a very weird place to kind of um, negotiate. To negotiate that space becomes quite interesting. Um, so I think that uh, figuring out cliches about coloreds and how we perceive not only in the rest of the world, but in, in Joburg even, is so different. So I think, yeah, growing up in Cape Town, um, it also allowed me to be in spaces like Frank Joubert um, Art and Design Center, which has now been renamed the Peter Clark um, Art and Design Center. I went there from when I was nine years old. And I think anywhere else um, that might have not been possible. So yeah, Cape Town's helped me a lot. At what point did you become brave and bold enough to be honest uh, as a creative um, you know that I find so many artists hide and then they're like terrified of the truth yeah. at what point did you say to the truth that I'm gonna deal with you I think it's not even per se the truth I think what most people are afraid of is being vulnerable because also when you make work and you don't make yourself vulnerable it's always evident in your work um, if you're trying to make work that's safer or that's not really addressing certain issues um, that you might be struggling with or society is struggling with. So I think it's, um, once I figured out that being vulnerable is also being strong, that's when things changed for me. Wow. Yeah. Being a voice, it's like a creative voice in this space, do you ever feel that pressure? Do you ever feel like, yeah, you I've, always I've feel got all of this on my shoulder, really? <laughs> I think I feel it one, like maybe twice a month where I feel like, um, you know, painting bananas and painting pawpaws is all fun and games, but like, what does it actually mean in a bigger context? Um, but I think that's part of being an artist, is having to wrestle, which is a good adjective, having to wrestle with yourself. <laughs> like, once every few weeks, you have to like, do that. Otherwise, you'll just make stuff that doesn't matter. Sure. And then what's the point of that? The, the one level of your creative work, you know, I. I, I completely get mm. this idea of you as an artist. What I'm interested in is the, the idea of building yourself into a brand, yeah. making yourself commercially interesting. Yeah. Do you enjoy that stuff or you just give it to someone else? No, I enjoy that stuff um, because I think when I first started studying art, um, there was this weird thing about the artist being the enigma, which I understand. You know, people want access to an artist and, and you want an artist to kind of be in a, cave, a dark cave making this work, you know, and then coming and giving that work to the world and then like scurrying back into the cave. But I think um, artistically, 
especially because the world for black artists and for artists of color is opening so much. I don't think we can trust galleries to translate and to explain to other people what we're about. So if you're black and you're an artist, I think that if you're not able to vocalize what you're about and you need to, you know, depend on someone who's white to do that for you, it feels weird in 2017 when there's Instagram, when there's Tumblr, God, Tumblr is old, old hat for me, but I just mean like when there's social media, you should be able to also trust yourself. So I think, um, I used to suffer for that a lot, like at the beginning when I first started making work and galleries would tell me, you know, you can't be on Instagram like that or you can't. And for me, that's weird is when people try to tell you what type of narrative to have. Um, so I don't know, I enjoy it and I enjoy being a social media savvy artist. I don't know. Um, I think accessibility to artists is an important thing. I also think also having a sense of mystery is also important as an artist. Um, which is why I talk so much, but actually I say nothing. <laughs> wow. <Thank you. laughs> but I think I like that. that's one of my um, good things. You flipped Scully into this sort of brand opportunity. Yeah. How much has that driven a big part of what your narrative is about as an artist? I work quite spontaneously. And so when I thought of the name Lady Scully, for me, it just summed up who I was, who I am, and who I will probably be for quite a while. But it was more about like feminine and masculine energy. Um, later on, obviously, Scully being a derogatory term, or not a derogatory term, but a term to stereotype and to be like, yo, that person of color, it's, he's got a Scully vibe, so just be aware, you know? That's always how my parents did it. Like, person of suspicion, a Scully. And so only later on when I, started being part of like street style culture and you know liking my sneakers and whatever did I figure out you can buy gangsterism like you buy a pair of Air Maxes. I want I want to go and have a look at some of your work but you know being able to being able to inspire the world to become curious about South Africa yeah I mean you're sort of a conduit you're like a, a broker of some sort <laughs> do you enjoy this next phase of your career where the world will get a chance to experience your country? Definitely, because for me, I had never been in London when I did my solo show in January. And I mean, it was minus three on my opening night and I thought no one would come, but they heard Africa and it was like, Malawians, unite! Nigerians, fourth! Kenyans, draw to get, like it was the diaspora of note. And I never expected it. And so I think what's exciting for me is maybe to have an authentic voice talking about South Africa. Um, talking about what we go through here. I mean, I talk a lot about rape and I talk a lot about abuse and I talk a lot about the plight of women. And I think what stuns me every time is when I speak to people about it and they go, what do you mean one in four people get raped? Like, that is crazy talk. Like, if that was the case here, we'd be up in arms. And I'm like, desensitizing. Like, we didn't desensitize as South Africans to a lot of things. So I think it's exciting for me to see people being interested in South Africa. Awesome, well let's go check out some of your work. Can we do that? Yeah, for uh, sure. Let's do it, let's do it. There was a moment in your career where you shaved your head. You kind of became yeah. well known. How, I remember once there was a feminist who was writing uh, novels and her work got stuck. And then someone inspired her to change her image. She changed her image and then she wrote three best-selling. Yeah. novels. I do believe there is a correlation in terms of how your image can block or help release something. What did it do for you? It's weird for me, I um, have always been known for my hair. So I used to like when I was a child firstly, uh, it was because I used to blow dry my hair out and make these giant Queen Amidala like sculptural hairstyles and do Bantu knots and just do lots of crazy stuff. And I went to an Afrikaner school, like a very staunch conservative Afrikaner school. And so they would always try to, you know, like, give me detention, you know, all of those things. But it wasn't Pretoria Girls High yet, so <laughs> it was 2004. <laughs> so usually they won, you know, if it was about, like, um, 
if it was about hair and you were black and then they would win and you just have to like tie your hair down. Um, so I think for a long time people knew me by my hair and then I had these massive curls and, and then eventually I was like actually how can people meet me and then they say they don't recognize me when my hair is tied back like that's bizarre. So then I just cut my hair off and I mean there is that cliche thing of a woman who cuts her hair is about to change her life but for me um, it's more because when I was a child, my mother used to say, which means dogs also shit hair. Okay. <laughs> like, oh, wow. It comes and it goes. And yeah, so it doesn't matter to me. Like, okay. mm. Tell us a bit about your work, your headspace at the moment. Like, is this piece of, this, this art here, uh, tell us a bit more about it. Um, this is a crazy work. It's a work that I actually made so that I could just like, come in every morning and pray to it. <laughs> like, like, I know it's idolatry, sorry. Okay. Um, but she's actually made up of about four works, okay. um, which I hated all of those works, and so I cut them up and then put them together in one work, which I now love. And then just to add to her transients, I just nailed her in. So she probably, once I take all these nails out, she'll be in tatters, and she probably won't be able to travel to the next studio. Okay. But I don't know, I like that transience of making things that sure disintegrate and then they're gone. A woman, if a young woman is out there, or any woman who has this sort of artistic instinct, you know, how should they begin to start developing a relationship with it? First, find your voice. Like, don't make work to sell. Like, don't make work thinking about selling yet. For me, I think it's always, I only got to be able to make works that I really enjoy and that I love and that makes other people feel like they can relate to what I'm doing once I got to know myself better. And I think that's something people always underestimate. They think that when you're an artist, you're supposed to like build this persona or this thing, when in actual fact, it's, it's like that hard shit of sitting in your room and asking yourself really hard questions about what you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to say. Um, without anyone sitting next to you going, mm, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons I left Cape Town. My work couldn't develop there because people are yes men. Not everybody, but people will come to your shows and say yes. They won't buy your work, but they'll say yes, yes, this is incredible, um, without really investigating or being critical or thinking, so yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time, awesome. We appreciate you joining us on Inside of Her C-Suite as we continue to explore leading voices who are shaping the future of Africa. Join us next week.